Thank you for joining us for today's episode. It is a good one. It gets off to a little bit of a slow start, in my opinion. And then I think it's really worth your time if you give it a listen. Today I'm speaking with Stephen Van Nortwick. And I had Stephen actually recorded a previous podcast uh, with him exactly a year ago. And that was episode number 35, Mycology and Wild Foraging. If you listen to that, you will know that Stephen is an amateur mycologist. He's done a lot of wild mushroom foraging. And in our conversation, we talk a lot about the environment and interconnectedness, um, man's connection with nature. And in this conversation, I really took it as an opportunity to reflect on the year of 2020, which has been such a weird year for so many of us. Uh, We recorded this the weekend after Thanksgiving. It was initiated in part because Stephen and I went to high school. I grew up in Raleigh, North Carolina, out there on the East Coast, and I was home visiting family, and Stephen sent me an article saying that there had been this protest downtown and that it had turned into this kind of battle or confrontation between you know different protest groups, basically like right and left wing, I guess, if we want to simplify it. And I talked to him, and, and he literally lives across the street from the governor's mansion, so he, from his front porch, can see the place where all these protests have been happening, and they've been happening there almost every weekend since May, uh, which is just amazing, right? I mean, it's it's not normal. He's lived there for, what, like 10 years, and he hasn't... You know, it's never this. It, this is a, a year different from previous years. Let's put it that way. Sometimes when you listen to a podcast, the host says something like, "And now for some housekeeping," and they kind of make some announcements about the show. So, time for some housekeeping. <laughs> um, I want my podcast to be a place where I can explore different topics with different people, and at the same time, there are some common threads that kind of weave them all together. One of the main topics that is discussed on this podcast is that of mental health, therapy, psychology, and meditation. And I see meditation as intrinsically tied up with mental health, that if you are practicing mindfulness and meditation in a good and authentic and correct way, you are increasing your mental health. And if it's not increasing your mental health, you should probably stop doing that practice. This conversation, you know, touches more on politics, and I get to share some of my thoughts about the world at large, and I really uh, value that and want to be able to do that. And so if that doesn't interest you, you know, feel free to not listen. In general, I try to title these podcasts in such a way that it can give you a sense of what they're about. I always spend some time creating an intro to let you know more about it, and you can decide if it's worth your time or not. And I say this in part because we live in this information age in which we are just inundated, if I'm saying that correctly, with information. It's a, it's a tsunami. It's, it's overwhelming. I don't want to just contribute to the noise, you know. I want to really have quality over quantity. I want to make each one of these episodes count. And I want to empower myself and you and everyone listening. We need to make good choices about what to spend our time and spend our attention on. And that's actually part of mindfulness practice, to reflect on how you're using your attention and if it is best serving you to use it that way. And so with all that said, I use this podcast as an opportunity to reflect on the year of 2020, to try to remember with Stephen the chain of events as things happened and how what we thought was happening, you know, how our concepts of that changed over time. You know, obviously coronavirus looms large over this year, but we also talk about uh, politics and the election, and it's interesting to reflect back on you know the first time I heard of coronavirus, probably back in January, right? And then hearing politicians, actually politicians from both sides, downplaying it, saying it probably wasn't going to be that big of a deal. Don't worry about it. Keep shopping, you know that kind of thing. And then the kind of general shutdown and restrictions in March, and then there were protests, which. Um, I was reminded of in talking to Stephen, the first protests were from people more on the right wing. They were protesting the shutdown, the restrictions, protesting mask wearing. They were generally mocked and made fun of in the media. Didn't seem like there were that many of them, but they looked very intimidating because they would dress up, you know, camo with their guns. And so Stephen shares about walking out to his porch one day and seeing a sizable group of men 
dressed in camo, carrying their guns down the middle of the street. And so that was this first kind of wave of protest. And then, of course, we had George Floyd and all the Black Lives Matter protests. And again, Stephen has an interesting perspective because he had the literal front porch view of it. And then there, were the, there was the looting and the rioting, and that um, is something that we talk about and something that happened here in Raleigh. And as I drove over to Stephen's house in downtown, I noticed that all the store windows are still boarded up. And I think this situation may be true across America. I believe it's also true in Denver, near where I live, um, where these stores and, and offices and things have had their windows boarded up. Uh, George Floyd was killed tragically May 25th. And I think I may have misspoken earlier. The first nationwide protest against the shutdown happened around April 15th. So from April, April 15th until now, and now the protests that Stephen has seen at least are about that Trump actually won the election, that the election was stolen, and then Black Lives Matter protests are continuing. So this has been a banner year for protests as well as virulent diseases. And I talk about all this with Stephen, you know, and just this idea of these different protest movements gathering and kind of battling each other in the street, you know, it could seem kind of humorous, but it's actually not that funny when you think about it. Luckily, we are far short of civil war, but you can't help think of how societies can head down that road. Um, the other thing that I thought about in creating this episode is how when I originally entered college, you know, as undergraduate, I went to University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, I was a journalism major. And I wrote for my high school newspaper. And for better or worse, I have rather obsessively followed the news over the years. Um, probably not for the betterment of my own mental health. <laughs> but I say this because I just have a long interest in history and politics and current events and in the philosophies or worldviews that underlie different beliefs, different political movements. Um, and there's two things that I remember in particular, which I wrote about for my high school newspaper. And the first was an essay arguing for the complete legalization of all drugs. Now, this was a pretty radical argument to make, especially being in high school, especially in the year, I believe it's the year 2000 or 2001. Um, but logically speaking, there's a strong argument to be made there and actually won an award for that article. And I believe that award helped me to, you know, go get into college. Um, but I didn't keep going with journalism. I guess this podcast for me has been a bit of a, a return, making a full circle there and connecting with that part of my life again. Um, the other thing that I remember writing about is the importance of the media. I had Noam Chomsky's old classic book, which was called Manufacturing Consent, and I highly recommend it. It was actually written in 1988, which is just amazing. It's all, it's all about the consoli consolidation, if I can say that right, of the media. And throughout the, you know, it's almost quaint to think about it now because the situation's gotten so much more extreme, but we used to have a lot of different media companies in this country. And in the nineties, they became bought up by fewer and fewer corporations. That situation has continued apace today. And now the internet has in a certain sense gone to the opposite end of the extreme. So we have a few so-called mainstream major corporations that control most of the media that we see except for the fact that there's the internet now, we can share things like this podcast. Anyone can get on YouTube, anyone can create a podcast and have a platform. But unfortunately, the problems with the more mainstream traditional media that Noam Chomsky and others were talking about, what, 30 years ago, they've just gotten worse. And so, you know, for example, like I talk about, an example I give in this conversation with Stephen is that of China, how these giant multinational uh, international corporations that have business interests in China, yeah, they're to some extent beholden to the Chinese government, and they have an economic incentive to be careful how they talk about that country. And I can I see that from time to time when I read the New York Times, when I read some of these newspapers. And so that's that's an, one example that I give. But I think there's been many examples like that where the media has shown its own biases, betrayed our trust, and empowered the rise in conspiracy thinking that is plaguing our country. So I believe that having a strong, independent, high quality journalism and media is absolutely essential to our society. And um, I'm not sure how the situation can improve because things like investigative journalism, take they take money, they take hiring people and paying their salaries. And um, for better or worse, our 
information ecosystem isn't really uh, incentivizing or supporting that kind of quality journalism. So we're constantly having to kind of filter what we hear. In any case, this is a topic I hope to cover in more depth in the future. So I just wanted to share a few of those thoughts with you all now. And without further ado, I bring you my friend Steven and a look back at the weird year that 2020 has been. Good to see you. Welcome back. I was just looking up, uh, Stephen, we recorded a podcast together almost exactly one year ago, the Sunday after Thanksgiving, and uh, that episode is called Mycology and Wild Foraging. And yeah, it's good to see you again. So much has happened in 2020. Um, you live in this, you know, an apartment in downtown Raleigh, right across near the governor's mansion. I do. Yeah, it's good to see you again. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Welcome back. It's been a year. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of change since last year. A lot has changed since last year. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I live downtown um, where a lot of the the action happens. And uh, it's been... uh, It's been interesting. It's been, you know, there's been a lot of different kinds of protesting going on, a lot of different um, kinds of information going around, a lot of different viewpoints. So... Yeah. I'm glad you're here. We could... Yeah, it's cool to Maybe catch up and catch up and discuss <laughs> some of that, and you it's, know, um, the yeah. world the world keeps turning. Yeah, and uh, you probably spent a lot of time in this apartment. Yeah, I have. <laughs> I, it's been an interesting year with the quarantine. I mean, I've been working too. I've been fortunate to work, which I'm grateful for. So um, my job, thankfully, is in the medical field right now. So I've been working in the office, and um, but there's a lot of people who are out of work. Yeah. So it's been a difficult year for a lot of people, for sure. Yeah, so, it's been a uh, weird, interesting time. It's been difficult. Yeah. But um, I was just thinking my, you know, I have family that lives in Raleigh, but they're not right downtown, so. Yeah, they're they, not too far away, but they're, yeah. They're, well, it's just this interesting yeah. phenomena of, I talked to you on the phone like, yesterday, and you were like, oh, there was this protest here last night, and I saw this and that, and like, right. my family had no idea that's even happening, so you've had this kind of vantage point on some of that stuff. Right, I've seen it from my front and porch so a just, lot of days. And yeah. you sent me, I saw the article you sent me from the local newspaper, like just yesterday there was two groups of protesters, one basically on the left, right, one basically on the right, and they're like kind of... Kind of like that, yeah. Classy. It sounded like... like they're I, fighting, like yeah. they're like, throwing I, punches, they're throwing insults, like it's, it's wild. It sounds like there was two or more different groups of protesters yesterday um and this will be on the opposite side of the governor's mansion to where i live um so thankfully it's not right inside of, or right outside my front door but it's it's around the block mm. so it's close enough that it's right there where, where streets are blocked there's a police presence um from what it sounds like at this point it is a lot of the um, the holdout, I don't know if you want to call them Trump supporters, the people who just are not, they're kind of protesting the closure of, of North Carolina and the whole COVID closure thing that's been happening. Right. Um, so they're protesting that. They're, they're kind of a mixed group of political opinions. And then you also have on the counter side of that, you have Black Lives Matter that's still protesting. You still have other people who are kind of standing up for um, you know racial injustice and causes to that effect, right. which is obviously still important right now. Um, so you've got a lot of different kind of mixed um, protests happening. Sometimes they clash. Um, and so it's been, yeah, yesterday was one of those days. Thankfully, nobody got hurt and it didn't escalate to that point. Thankfully, nobody got hurt. Yeah. Um, it seemed, now to me, thankfully in Raleigh, it, most, most, you know, in my opinion, most of the time we've had pretty good um, oversight as far as not letting anything get too out of control, um, which is what we were kind of talking about with the whole rioting thing or the looting situation <laughs> and that yeah, whole that well, whole phenomena of what really happened and how that went down yeah, and, i'm glad you mentioned that i guess um, i just wanted to say like i kind of jumped into this and we're going to get to this i kind of want to set up the conversation by just hearing more from you check sure. in and then and then like what we were talking about before we started recording here like going through some of the chronology because so much has so much has happened this year, and so like, 
you know, for like in this conversation, I think it's interesting to reflect a little bit on the politics and on coronavirus and on the differences you're experiencing out here in North Carolina. I'm in Colorado most of the time. It's um, for sure. It's, if you get, it's interesting how yeah. uh, where you live obviously still matters so much. And sometimes when you we kind of live so much of our lives mentally on the internet, where we get right. news from all around the world or around the country, we forget about our locality, our time and space, and how different parts of this country have react. You know, different populations obviously within this country are, are kind of living in different realities. Oh, it's wild. It's been wild. That's, yeah. yeah. And it's been, I mean, the, the, to begin with, if you want to start, and that's the thing is that we could talk about what happened yesterday and that's like, well, that's like, just yesterday. That's a good segue. You know? Yeah. But let's go back to our, the beginning of the year. And that, our first episode was about you, like your wild mushroom foraging, sure. all the mycology stuff, a lot about the nature and environment. And that's still a passion years. And that fits into the story too. Sure. Because coronavirus obviously is a force of nature. Right. And uh, we're, we're a herd animal and we're, you we're know, acting out trying to do the best we can with it to protect ourselves, but we're so incredibly interconnected, which is something else we talked about the first episode, so that this pathogen can spread and affect us like this. The fear can spread, the, po- the po- political protests can spread. Right. In a certain way, coronavirus is a disease that's spread across the land. Our politics are another kind of disease that spreads across our minds. Absolutely. All the shit online, all right. the Facebook, all the social media stuff. We even talked about China, I think, in our last episode. We did. We, yeah. we talked about things coming from China. Not yeah. specifically a virus, but we were talking about like, hey, we need to be skeptical of these things. And Well, I'm a huge you know. skeptic of the Chinese government. I think they deserve to be criticized. And a lot of people in the so-called mainstream media really avoid criticizing and talking about China in a negative way because they're so powerful, because the media companies that own those news corporations are indebted to China, work for China, have business basically in China. And that's, been, that's one example of how this, the so-called quote-unquote mainstream media has been criticized, like it's an example of where their financial interests get in the way of news coming through. Like we don't hear that much about the Muslim right. population that's being, has a genocide against them right now. We don't hear that much about right. the Tibetan people that have a genocide against them right now. We don't hear that much about, we did hear a lot about the Hong Kong protests. You know? Right. So that's that's one example where we have heard a lot. But And the issue for most people like you and me is like, there's not a whole lot we can do from our situation on our day-to-day basis that can change what's happening in Hong Kong or right. some of these other places, um, possibly our, our leadership or government officials can, can sway opinions, but there's a, there's a whole, that's a whole different side of the world with a different government. Um, but when it comes to commerce and yeah. transmission of viruses and <laughs> health and safety, I mean, that's, it's, that's super important too. Yeah. You know? it, it, it's, it, it's kind of fascinating to me that coronavirus has been so politicized sure. that to say, to, to call it the Chinese virus, just because that's something Trump said, that's like politically incorrect and people criticize that and they're outraged by that. Right. It's also factually true. It's a virus from China. Right. That has infected the world. Right. And that does, I just feel like that deserves to be talked about, not in a racist way, in, not in a way of blaming other people, but in a way of understanding why are these diseases always coming from China? Blah blah blah. Right. And and why and like it's to me it's an example of how some of the discussion in the um, mainstream media has been circumscribed in this odd way. Right. And well, and it's it's still a question of how it and where it began and its origins and you know how it came to America. Well, and we just you thought know. that interesting environmental connection with it emerging from the marketplace where animals, wild animals, are being taken and killed. That's and likely. That it's very likely. Like the, the destruction yeah. of the environment. It's, it sounds like that's a likely cause, and there's science to prove that up um, yeah. and say that that's been a case of other kinds of viruses that, that have outbreak or had outbreaks from situations like that. Um, there's wet markets and bad health and um, environmental yeah. standards, and who knows what's contaminating other kinds of things. And then that goes down the line and contaminates a human. Yeah. Um, so that's scary. Um, and then the question from well, that point was kind of like, how do we handle that? And then, you know, and as I, I know firsthand, especially from my field, there has been different information from federal officials as opposed to state officials. It's been so confusing. And then every business is kind of up for their, to fend for themselves. You know, are they going to shut down? Are they going to stay open? What's the situation? Mm-hmm. Are they able to stay open? Or should they furlough their employees? Um, so there's been a lot. It's been... A roller coaster, to say the least, for most people, and um, I think first and foremost, safety and health is really what's most important. We sh- we should, if it comes to 
quarantining, staying at home, having social right. um, distancing, you know, wearing a face covering. I think that's really important. It's to, important to wear a mask. I'm in favor of that. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if it's if it's a how enforced it is. I don't know. It, it depends. I think it's ultimately up to um, individual businesses and individual people to do that. I don't think the government can make everybody wear a face covering. You know, I, don't, I just don't think that's going to happen. You don't think they can do that? Or you don't think they should do that? I think they, I think they can in terms of a, um, you know, like a statement in a legal situation, but I don't think they can enforce it the we way can't really that... enforce it, but we should get the know, information out that we should be wearing a We mask. should be, we absolutely. Yeah. What, what about you? Yeah. Did you... Um, this area got shut down too, right? Did you not go into work for a certain amount of time? So what happened, I work in, um, I've been working in a orthopedic setting. So people who have, you know, injuries and, and medical issues like right. that. Um, our facility, particularly, I know a lot of them in, had a similar situation, um, had a, basically a urgent care only basis where, where a lot of the appointments that we would normally take, a lot of the surgeries were put on hold. Um, a lot of telemed conferencing was happening. So there was a lot of virtual stuff happening. Um, which in which in effect laid off a lot of employees. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, even in the medical field, got laid off because not not just put on pause, but fired. Right, those positions might not have come back at this point just because of the situation. Um, now, if you're in like a hospital, then you might have stayed, you know, going full time the whole, you know, full gear the whole guy. Well, there's a period where the <clears> office <throat> shut down, and then a period and when it opened back up. My particular office did not shut down. Just we we open. had we stayed open for urgent care and and minimized our our person-to-person -person settings for a while um and again i work in an orthopedic practice so people you know fall off their bike or they you know they go on a run and twist their ankle they're going to come in and, and see one of our doctors so that was kind of something that was deemed essential and so we kept we kept up and running but a lot of the surgeries that they were doing a lot of the surgeons that were doing um elective surgery those were put on hold because it wasn't necessarily the right thing to do during a COVID outbreak right. um so they did that, I think, until, I want to say June or July. And then we kind of got back up to full gear, and most of the doctors are kind of back in the practice seeing patients yeah. again. But then the, the, well, the, so the changes of, like, the, the restrictions on how people come in and how they're being seen and how they're treated have changed um, accordingly every, you know, week to week, it feels like sometimes. Or, um, that's interesting. Yeah, so it's, that's the other hard part of keeping up with is everyone in the healthcare industry is also trying to keep up with how do you keep people safe, but how do you also keep people What are some safe? of those changes? Um, well, again, like initially screening them, you know, asking them have they traveled outside the country. And this again, was that, at the beginning. this was at the beginning when people still could have been traveling in and out of the country. Uh, We're saying, hey, have you traveled to China or have you been out, you know, have you been in Europe the last See, couple of weeks? So interesting to look back and think about this because so much has happened. To, to remember hearing about it in the news and then hearing about it coming to America and then, you know, politicians kind of dismissing it. Right. And then all of a sudden this general lockdown, which is something none of us had ever experienced before in our lifetimes. And mm -hmm. then, um, right. And then from that point and like the fear and confusion and what we thought was happening then and then what we know now, like there's been a lot of changes. Right. For example, remember when they were making a huge deal about not touching your face with your hands? Correct. I didn't yeah. hear about that anymore. Right. And well, then, and then right. the, some of the doctors, like Fauci, unfortunately, I think in this case, said that we didn't need masks in the beginning. And then later, everyone's like, "Oh, masks are good. We should all be wearing masks." So that's a big change in terms of our information. So it makes sense that we're like people get a little skeptical or confused. Or it seems like there was kind of like a collective uh, thing with the the mask thing, especially because I noticed, especially when I go to the grocery store. Over time, it was like, okay, this a few people had a mask, and then like within a week or two, it was like, okay, most people had a mask. Now, you know, like everyone. now everyone is re supposedly required to have a mask. I still see people uh -huh. you know, flaunting that in North Carolina and other states. See, but um, <laughs> that being said, most of the time um, when you go out in, in public, and even I see people walking around the neighborhood, um, they'll wear a face covering, which I think is, is respectful and also, again, a good probably a good safety um standard for that. I think it's um, good if you're getting your people, and I think it's good to wear overall, especially inside. Um, right. And I feel fine with that, especially at work. Like, I feel protected because that's, from my vantage point, I am dealing with 50 to 100 people a day. Right. So if I'm wearing a face covering, if someone else on the other side of the, of the desk is wearing that too, I feel 
better myself. I, I have no problem doing that. It's the proper thing um, to do. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Well, so, and then you're here probably <laughs> spending a lot more time than normal in your apartment. Right. And then the first, tell me if I'm getting this wrong, but the first protest that you saw outside your windows was uh, people, do you want to talk about it? Oh yeah, yeah, right. So like most people, you know, you're kind of heeding the advice of the administration saying you should probably um, stay at home if you are not at work or not going to the grocery store, you should probably stay at home. And so I've been doing that most of the time, um, aside from going to work. Now the difference being that I think it was early May was when the initial protest, the first one, you know, to the stay at home order in effect was the um, small gang of camouflaged <laughs> um, rifle carrying. So this is the right wing kind of. I would say this is probably the more extremist right wing um, gun toting camouflage guys. What did they look like? Um, there, it was, I don't know, maybe 10 to 15 of them. And they, so they, small, small. In my, and again, I live in the middle of downtown Raleigh. So, you know, when, when things happen, they're generally right outside my front door. So they're literally walking by. So they, I, I, I remember going outside and literally saw these guys walk by my front door, um, with their guns and protest gear. And, um, they didn't, you know, they didn't Cam hurt. Yeah. Camouflage. They didn't hurt anyone, obviously, which was nice. Um, but they, or I should say, um, Anyway, they, they didn't hurt they didn't hurt anyone, thank God. Um, but what they did was they kind of posted up across the street and they said, you know, we don't like these COVID restrictions. We need to reopen the state, um, right. which then sparked a kind of movement um, online, on Facebook, on other social media to, to reopen North Carolina, which I think right. had good intentions to begin with, aside yeah, from the know. gun guys. Yeah, I, I think I think and they look scary, right? They, well, they, they but the, the funny many, thing, right? Thing that I was saying before um, is like. They literally have in our constitution. It literally says they have the right to do that, the right to carry, to have a gun, and the right to freedom of assembly. It's their First Amendment. So it's there. Was, there was something it's an interesting. It's an yeah. interesting thing to protest for your rights that are guaranteed in our constitution. Is it when I first heard about that kind of stuff? Because it didn't just happen here. I think it was across the country in different places like Michigan. Right. And the ones where they went inside the state house. And when I first heard about that, I was like, okay, you know, it's easy to kind of dismiss it or. Think it's scary or wrong, but I kind of understand it more now. Later, like I've actually a friend of mine gave me a copy of the Constitution the other day, so I recently read some of right. these parts of it, and it made me think about it and see it in a new way, which I think was part of their point. So, well, if you don't the fact that no yeah. one was hurt and no right. businesses and property are damaged, I think that's meaningful. I think it was more an, an intimidation factor. It was saying like, "Hey, we're we're not we're not about this whole shutdown thing. It's it's infringing on our rights to be." whatever the American they think they are. And so they're going to yeah. run around with their guns and like let people know that. And, and that we do have open carry laws where people can go certain places with guns. Um, it's, which It's scary which, and weird and it's, it's just a weird American thing. It's a very, do that. it's a very American thing. You're not going to see that in most countries that are, that are like, at a, you know, um, but, but again, it, it's not, it's, they weren't like shooting in the air and, 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 they didn't <clears throat> making threats to people personally. They were just hiking down right. the road. And had, if they had done something um, like that, then they would have broken a law. Then they hopefully would have, and I think they would have been arrested. Right, for sure. So it's, and, that's interesting. And I think at this point where we are now, if, if, if they were doing the same kind of thing, there would be more of a police presence. This was back in... This was like early a, May. This so was like a shock, right? Like people weren't expecting that. Yeah, it kind of came out of nowhere. These guys just kind of showed up and were like, "Hey, we're here." You and know? the one in Michigan, they and, like and went then, inside the right. And I was actually, house, right? I was actually in Michigan when that happened. Oh, really? So, okay. so I took off and I said, "All right, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna during this this time, oh. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go up north and." and do, <laughs> so I was doing my usual. So um, part of your reason for going to Michigan at that time was the protests. Well, and then you end up getting more of it out there. I think it was in a way to take a, you know, I, again, like I had kind of been working through this experience and, and I thought, okay, maybe by like, you know, naive, like, Hey, maybe by summertime, this whole COVID thing will be a wash. And I remember we'll, thinking that too. Right. Yeah. That was kind of the information. And then I we, thought by this time it would be done. Right. And here we are. Here we are. So I thought, you know, again, like, well, I already, I go up there, I mushroom forage. I, you know, yeah. I, I go hiking a lot. I spend time. So I was like, well, I'm going to keep doing that. And what are those little um, rocks that you get? Uh, the Petoskey stones. So the okay. Petoskey stones up there, stones. you know, they come up on the shore. Um, so I figured, you know, well, remind, remind me how old those are. Oh, uh, <sighs> was it like 300 million years old? 300 million yeah. Those, yeah, are, those are really incredible. fossilized coral from, from, um, several ages ago in the ice age. Mm. Um, 
But um, but for many reasons, I, you know, including mushroom forging, I would go up there and, and relax and kick back. But I, I remember being in Michigan when the um, the guys with guns and uh, went did the same kind of thing, but they did it at the state capitol. They said they, they went to the state capitol, they took over in Michigan, and they said, went hey, inside, right? They went inside and they say we we want. We, we demand that you open the state back up. Those pictures were um, so which could wild. have tur- which I mean, if you think about it, that could have turned really, really, really ugly. Um, if if somebody had popped off and decided that like, hey, this is real serious now at this point or something, and you know, it's it's one thing to have a show of um, protest, right? But when you when you take guns in, into effect, it kind of brings it to a different level, I think, in my opinion. So I think that what you're talking about there, plus coronavirus, obviously, the, and Donald Trump being the White House, obviously, like the tension in our country was really rising, you know, and summer was coming, and people sure. were kind of freaked out in general, and then. George Floyd happened, and then right. We've so had protests ever since. Right, and that was not too far. You know, that's on the other side of the lake, really. Um, so I came back from Michigan, and it was the first weekend I had come back from from being up there, and that was you. You know, you hear about the rioting and the looting and whatnot. That was the very first night of that here in downtown Raleigh. There was that mm-hmm. one. There was that one night. It was I think it was May thirtieth or thirty first where the main street in downtown Raleigh was, was taken over by a large group of protesters and um, from different groups. It was not necessarily just the Black Lives Matter protesters. It was many different groups. The Black Lives Matter well, protests was happened. Main, wasn't that the, the main protest group? That was in the afternoon. See, that's the misconception. So okay. some of the misinformation is out there. It's like, well, here's the Black Lives Matter. They're destroying everything. Well, what really happened, in my opinion, because I, you know, I lived down here, was that Black Lives yeah. Matter had a protest that afternoon in the, day. in the daytime, and it was, for the most part, pre- peaceful. Nobody was banging anything up. Um, that subsided, and then after dark that night, some other people came out and started causing problems. They were, you know, um, breaking windows. Um, I, I believe the two buildings or the two businesses that were, were looted were the CVS and the Dollar General. <laughs> that are downtown. So I think people went in and took a bunch of stuff and let, went out. Um, the police had kind of warden, cordoned off both of the ends of the street. And then that's when you see the images on the news of like, you know, police versus these protesters and tear gas was getting, getting thrown back and forth. So this, and this was that night? This was that very, the like the last night of, of May, like the 30th in um, downtown Raleigh. Yeah. So the, and, and so, the, and the there protesters was, were there and they were, it was like looting, they said that, right? There was a couple. Really? What, of, what happened exactly? Right, so a couple. Bi- there was basically a big protest gathering in the middle of downtown Raleigh, and and people started. Um, I don't, you know, again, I wasn't there. I was here at my house, but from it was about three blocks from here. Because um, if you, because if I windows didn't. were broken, so you know, a lot of the businesses on Fayetteville Street, most of the windows were broken. Right. Um, a couple of the businesses had things stolen from the businesses. Like dozens of businesses, right? Like when I drive over here today, yeah, all those businesses down there have boards over their windows, right? Like how many? What, eight, seven months later, uh, this is so. probably like a four or five block kind of span. You know what okay. I mean? Yeah. And and what happened was, um, the the you know yeah the the windows were broken on some of those streets, and then um, people replaced those windows, and then there kept being these like additional protesting because like you know if protesting is going to happen around here it usually happens in downtown and so every time there's a threat or a kind of premonition that there's a protest going to happen these businesses have have boarded up or they just kept their boards up because they just kept them up the whole time most of them have well if you look at the artwork it's kind of been up because <laughs> um well again because some of the street artists well some of these bars just haven't <laughs> reopened i mean the, right. the, the, there's been this kind of like push to reopen everything i mean i've got a friend who works in the gym um industry and he's you know they're trying to get gyms open they're trying to get bars open the restaurant industries and the music industries i feel really bad for because none of the music none of the concerts are happening that's terrible um so there's a lot of ill effect from this in downtown um but yes destroying destroying property is not the answer um so that happened that night and doesn't like no one got injured but Businesses, it's, it's sound, property was damaged. To what I remember, there might have been a couple people who were injured. There was a, I know there was a dozen or two oh, people. That there, there, yeah. It sounds like some people were were arrested um, so that I think, night. I think a similar dynamic played out in Denver, <clears throat> near me, and probably in other cities. I think most cities, cities around well. around the country that that same weekend that kind of thing happened, and then I remember the next night 
So the next day, the next day, there was a Black Lives Matter protest. Was it a Sunday now? Which was a Sunday night. Yeah. Um, Sunday. Again, typically the Black Lives Matter protests have been peaceful. They're kind of more of a peaceful, um, but they are they have been you know there's many people so they've come down. They've, there's a lot of energy. There. There's a lot of energy. Um, there's a lot of signs. There's a lot yeah. of um, shouting, shouting sometimes. And again, they're not you know they're they're not out there threatening anyone. Well, and they're just saying. Is, this is the, where we are. Part of the dynamic is kind of this protesters versus the police dynamic that was so disturbing. Right. And, and I'm thankful it didn't get worse than it did, but it's so disturbing to see that. And that's what happened the second night, right? So the, the Black Lives Matter protest ended up at the governor's mansion across the street. And um, <laughs> there had then, from that first night, been a helicopter pretty much flying 24-7 around the house. And that's when tear gas was used against Black Lives Matter protests, which, again, they weren't out there hurting anyone or destroying any property, but they had tear gas thrown against them. So what you were saying, um, what you were saying to me before we started recording was the night before, late at night, is when the looting happened with these different groups, and then the next day, the Black Lives Matter was basically peaceful, but that's when the police kind of retaliated. Yeah, that's when the it people stepped that were being it up peaceful and then right. got tear gas and they didn't right. deserve it, maybe? Right, that's when it kind of got taken to... Um, the next level, I guess you could say. Um, so you basically have peaceful protesters doing their thing and then bam, they're just getting gassed and like, right. that's going to stay with you. That's right. not a pleasant experience. Well, and then to also see the reopen NC, um, crowd that was, that was marching around the governor's mansion, which is a very different dynamic, Yeah. but they were also a big group of people. I mean, nothing was really retaliated against them in that certain way. But what's been happening is that a lot of these places like the mansion, it's like, well, you know you're not going to get action by protesting at the door of the governor's house. You know, that's not exactly the way to, to get your action resolved. Like you might want to talk to your legislatures. Um, like you mean it's not that practical, like it's not the practical impact of it. That's kind of what I'm getting at. I think, I think the protests are important no matter what you protest. I think, I, I think in a peaceful manner, um, you know, I, I don't, um, obviously I don't support walking around with guns and, and, threatening anybody um but i definitely support peaceful protest um i'll say that so yeah um it's a difficult line because i think there's there's well, a lot of pent up um like heartbreak and anger and confusion about mm -hmm. this you know if you set just COVID aside and you look at some of the um, racial injustice in our country I, I mean there's no denying that it's pretty heartbreaking um so i call i see it as a call for this topic to be addressed in a deeper right, way on right. a societal level, and I hope that happens. I think with the new, with Biden coming in, there's a chance that will happen more. I think that's part of the problem is we didn't have necessarily a good um, voice of reason in the last few years, to say the least. And so <laughs> um, to have a, maybe a light at the end of this tunnel and to have maybe a brighter future with some, some more perspective on this topic and maybe to get back to the more, but anyway, yeah, yeah. To kind of get back to your point. Um, no, I'm, I'm just saying, I see, I think the Biden administration is going to return us to what has felt more normal, what we've gotten used to before Trump. But the other thing right. I was going to say, and we don't have to get too much into this, but you know, obviously Biden won the, you know, to get to the politics stuff, like Biden won the, the presidency, but a lot of state and local races actually went Republican in ways that surprise people. Usually the president that wins, you know, the party that wins the White House has this like down ticket effect where like the Senate right. and the House and the governors and blah, blah, blah. Right. That didn't happen this year. And I think, right. I think that um, just this question of did these Black Lives Matter protests overall, and maybe it's too soon to answer it or different people have their own opinions, but did it translate into effective change at the polls that this November? Because now we're, we're recording this after the election, right? Sure. The answer seems like no. Like the main, the average American didn't feel inspired by those protests to vote Democrat when they otherwise would have voted Republican, except for maybe the presidency. That's how I see it. I don't know. It's hard to say. It's, yeah, that's for the, uh, man, that's a really great question because I mean, there's, there's so many different aspects to how that went down. And I think you got a mixture of people who, I, 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 okay, I'll put it this way. I think there was a, I think there's a definite call to action from Black Lives Matter. I think a lot of yeah. people feel inspired from that. And I think it did mobilize voters. Um, like we did have the highest turnout. I think it mobilized a lot of people to 
look at their own situation and, and maybe um, and reflect, on reflect that. a little bit, especially with all this being at home and you're kind of glued to your, your phone and what's going on yeah. with your neighbors. Um, so I think there, how we, I don't know if we can quantify the effect it had on, on, like you said, the vote, because you do, you do see a lot of Republican uh, seats yeah. that stayed, that stayed the same. Yeah, there wasn't, you know, and I think they did well on a state level from what I read too. Um, yeah, most of the states, um, you know, aside from the ones that are kind of flipping yeah. to the Democrats. Um, well, this one I want to, um, yeah, th- thinking sure. about this, what I wanted to say is like, um, where's my thought? I'm losing it. <laughs> oh, it's the, um, I think a lot of people in this country did reflect on race and our history and these issues because of these protests, but they didn't necessarily come down to, or come to the same conclusions as maybe a lot of people in the media or a lot of social justice activists thought they would or assumed they would. It's like right. you could vote for, for example, the idea of police funding. Like you could vote to support the police and actually increase their funding without being a racist. And I think that this kind of distinction has kind of gotten lost in some of the dialogue and some of the polarization that's happened in our politics. Yeah. And one of the most fascinating, fa- fascinating things that I just recently read about Trump, you know, more people of color, more black people, more Hispanic people voted for him this time around than last time around. And the, the biggest demographic difference in voting was white men who voted for Trump the first time around voted at a less, much less percentage this time around. So they... That was the biggest demographic group that broke for Biden. And I just think that's that's fascinating and it's amazing. And a lot of the narratives and simplistic ideas we hear about race and conservative and liberal and Trump and all this stuff, like those ideas don't play out in the reality of many people's lives in this country. Like I, visit, I visited the border of Texas and uh, Mexico, uh, what was it, two years ago? And I met a lot of people there, like everyone was driving around in pickup trucks with uh, American flags and Trump stickers on them but they're all Hispanic, you know, they're all Hispanic people. And so I realized when I visited there, and it's a, it's a really interesting and kind of bizarre part of America that a lot of people don't see, but when I, I just, I realized that the stereotype we have of so-called people of color voting always for the Democrat party, that's, that's an idea that we need to let go of. That's not the reality, and it shouldn't be the reality, and it's actually racist to assume that. It's, yeah, to assume that you have a block of voter yeah, that Democrat to assume that it's racist. Is, is, in a way. And that's where the Democratic Party has its own racism. Right. And no one wants to talk about that. So anyway, that's, that's just some of my thoughts about it. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a di- yeah, we could definitely get into the, the voting block. Um, and I think it's it's never a good thing to generalize. You shouldn't generalize who's who's gonna vote for who. I don't believe we should pigeonhole it. I believe everyone's an right. individual, everyone gets to have their own life experience and come to their own conclusions. Right. And they have their own reasons for why they might end up making a choice at the ballot box. They might not even like the choice, but our system gives them such poor choices, that's what they have to go with. So there's that and it, yeah, it's a difficult system because you have people who are there for the political gain and, and um, who's you know who, who are kind of the next in line in these positions, and you see people like you know in these Senate seats that are these, you feel like they're there for 20, 30 years, and they are. And there's and, corruption, and, and, and there's some you know often. you could argue the level of corruption in a lot of those seats based on I mean, what on. you know what the <laughs> uh, you you know. It, you yeah. have to be an idiot not to see that the corruption is so obvious. Right. All our corporations give money to both political parties. Right. We're just they're just buying influence all the time. There's a lot of lobbying. Lobbying, of lobbying. lobbying goes a, a ton of lobbying, ton of lawyers. Anyway, the super PAC thing goes. Yeah, we could go off. We could, we could go on about like the politics of the politics. I guess I mean, what I'm it's, saying it's bad. It's I guess bad. what I feel like I'm moved to say now in this conversation with you that I, I don't think I, I really talked about on my podcast that much is like this last year has shown me that the mainstream media really does have biases and they really do have incentives and some of the stuff that gets labeled conspiracy thinking i'm not a conspiracy theorist i don't believe in it but some of the stuff that might get put in that bin conceptually speaking is a way of clamping down like discussion around our media which needs help it needs to be improved it's it's not functioning in a good way that's serving us as well as it could be right that's that's a whole other big topic that's yeah but 2020 and like hearing about these protests from you who witnessed them with your eyes it's like helping me Remind me about it. It's also helping me yeah. see it in a new way because our news isn't always reliable. Well, it's it's difficult. Like I, it makes me think of like um, I have a 
a coworker who is like, it reminds me of throughout this year, she's asked me like, how's all the rioting going on downtown? How's all the looting? You know, as if so the it's, media that she was getting was exaggerating it, maybe. Yeah, and, and even the and I'm not I'm not just saying like the national media. I'm saying like local media has, has kind of exaggerated a lot of this stuff. Well, to, how many times was there looting? Th- that's kind of what I'm getting to. So really, that one night was really it, um, mm-hmm. and it wasn't necessarily like I said, Black Lives Matter. It was multiple groups. You could argue there was evidence of uh, the, you know, what do you call them, Proud Boy. The Proud Boys? Gang or whatever. Stand down, yeah, stand those guys. Yeah, <laughs> sure. There's actual like evidence um, of, of some of the destruction that I feel like they were, uh, what's the word, provocators in some of this yeah. looting. But, There's a lot of that. There's a lot of people that are trying to kind of provoke some things, but thankfully, knock on wood, like, we haven't had a major... Yeah. Uh, and I, like, we're not in a civil war. I think, and, and that's what some people have brought to my attention, like, oh, we're going to go to civil war. And I'm like, I really don't think we're going to, because we have, we have too many people like me and you who are more or less, you know, we're reasonable people. We might disagree about some little things, and, you know, um, I feel like politically we're, we're on the same page, but... You know, there might be some life choices that we're different on or whatever, but we're not going to come to arms to that. Right. You know, and that's I think... The, that's what we all need to think about and, like, like really be able to disagree without being I, so angry or violent. Well, and I think that's one, been one blessing about watching, you know, finally after, um, like, you know, let's not even talk about the stress and anxiety level of this year, um, but after the election, okay, well, nobody, you know, there wasn't really all of this rioting on either side, and nobody was getting killed or shot or injured like on about, the actual election night. Right. Like, you know, people that went to the polls or, or the, the night after or the weeks have, you know, and, and then again, that's the thing the weeks since the election, there's still been protesting outside. It's not necessarily Black Lives Matter, but now it's the Trump supporters who seem to think that there's an illegitimacy going on. So think the election's been stolen, so they're protesting. So they're out there protesting and they've been doing these, you know, and, and again, it, it's, it's a small handful of people, right? It's, it's getting, it's not like thousands of people we're talking about. It's like maybe 50 to a hundred, okay. you know, and, yeah. and that's but they're making noise and they're out there and they're making noise and they're out there. And again, that's what I chose, um, to deal with by living in this area of town. You kind of get some of that action when yeah. you live in such a center part of the city. Um, and again, I, I feel like it's okay to protest if you really want to. Um, but to what end and what, right. what action are you going to take to, to maybe change that? Yeah. Um, you know, it made me think when you're talking of like, I'm kind of glad that, uh, people can gather and protest peacefully, sure. whatever it is they're protesting about, as long as they're not causing damage or hurting people. Right. And but yeah, it's kind of the price you pay for living in this area. So. My main issue is I think the misinformation factor is that like, okay, well, if you don't fly an American flag, you're not an American. Or if you think that that's everything's getting looted yeah. and it's like, well, it's really not getting looted every night. It happened one night. There's still protesting going on. You're going to find extreme pockets of that in different places, you know, like yeah. more places that are, that are likely to have that kind of stuff or, or not. So that's, what's interesting about Raleigh is we get a little flavor of that, but I wonder if the looting it yeah. probably was, I wonder if it was significantly worse in other areas. I don't know a ton about it, but it's interesting how, all this time later, so many businesses and windows down there are still boarded up. And that, it's just like, yeah. even if it was just one or two nights, it still has a big impact. It does. And it kind a, of yeah. towards the protest movement. Yeah. And that's part of what I was saying on the, on the ballot. It's like, right. I, I mean, I went to Black Lives Matter protests several times in Denver and supported it. And, um, you know, because I support reforming our justice system, you know, supporting a lot of the ideals behind it. I don't necessarily agree with everything that someone for Black Lives Matter says, though. So, I don't know, I have mixed feelings about it. Right. But I think overall it's a good conversation that we need to talk about and debate and come to, like, some new agreements as a society. Like, things like ending the war on drugs, I think there's a lot of support for that now. It's something, something that I don't just believe about now. I actually wrote an editorial for my high school newspaper. I won an award for it, <laughs> arguing for the legalization of drugs. Right. Like, completely, like, all of them. And um, it was a good, it was a very good, it's a very good, strong, logical argument then. And it's obviously now more people are coming around to it. But um, I think that, I don't know what to <laughs> Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different, so there's, I mean, again, there's, this has been a year, right? You're dealing with a pandemic that, that, that the world has never seen. You're being yeah. told to stay home, not to socialize with your friends and family. But, you but know? Now the pandemic's getting worse again. Now the pandemic, I mean, that's, that's the, like, Again, like let's look at when we were shut down, so to speak. The numbers are twice or three times as bad right now than when we when we were shut down. 
And I think it's part of our American culture where even you and I are like, hey, man, we are sick of being at home. Like, we let's go out to a concert. Everyone has COVID fatigue. You know, I, I can't yeah. tell you what I would pay to go to a concert right now and see just a great night of music with my friends. But it's like, well, it also seems kind of unrealistic. And it seems maybe a little selfish to, to kind of... Yeah. Well, that's um, the other debate that we are being forced to have, but we should have it. We should have it in like a really good, intelligent way. It's like right. our individual actions affect other people. Right. And so as much as we value our freedom individually, we have to value our our relationship with everyone. So that's it's just sure. so interesting that this has forced this conversation in so many ways. It's been, a, it, yeah. And, and I think um, most importantly, in, in terms of like our country as a whole, I think it's really important that we all get back on a stable ground in terms of an economy. Like I think, yes, it's really important that we get these businesses back up and running. Um, but also how do we do it safely is really, really important. <laughs> and, um, that's, that seems to be the million dollar question is how do we open bars? How do we open restaurants and places of business without making the situation worse? And ultimately it comes down to people because it's like, well, you can ask somebody not to go do that, but they're going to still go do it. Um, you know, the, the main well, restrictions is really traveling outside the country right now. That seems to be so, yeah. you, know, you can't do that. Um, what well, is another th- thought I had about all this, like uh, China right now reports almost zero cases of coronavirus. It's amazing. It may or may not be totally true, but the point is they locked down their country hardcore oh, sure. for 11 weeks where you would get arrested, you know, maybe put in jail if you left your home. Right. And so given the choice between these two, getting back to China, but right. I, I love, I love our society. I like, right. I like our ideals. I like our constitution. I like what we believe in and stand for. I'd rather live here than there, even if they don't have coronavirus. Like, right. I, you know, I'd rather have well, our freedoms. There, right. There's actually a conversation to be had here right. between freedom and that kind of oppressive action that did save lives. But at what cost? Do you, we don't want to give our government that kind of power for good reasons, right? Well, and that's what I get back to with like enforcement, right? Like if, if I'm like hanging out at my house and in my garden and, and, you know, just having a bonfire, well, I'm not going to necessarily wear a mask or a face covering because I'm in my backyard. Right. But if I go to the grocery store or I go to a business, I expect to do that right now because that's what the protocol is. Um, and I feel like a business has the right not to serve a customer or a patient if they refuse those guidelines at this point. Um, that, that seems to be kind of a sticky issue because I, I still deal with that in my office where people come in without a, a face covering and they, you know, oh, really? um, sometimes people, you know, some people, it, I it's, feel like it's, there's more of that happening here than in Colorado. Yeah. And I think, I, I think also like it, it, during the middle of the summer, I think it was more of a argument kind of thing. It was people were like, well, I'm not going to do this for this reason. And now I think we've gotten to a point in our, in our society where it's like, well, we all understand that we, this is kind of what we have to do right now. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's ultimately up to individuals. And I think, um, that's kind of the, the freedom that the, the blessing and curse of, of our freedoms, right. Is like, yeah. it's ultimately up to us to make those choices yeah. and we don't have to, um, which is why you often are seeing, um, some of these more rural areas have outbreaks now is because it's kind of, you yeah, know, the, that's the, 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 it's kind of reached those points. And then the problem is in terms of a healthcare standpoint, they're not as well equipped in terms of hospitals and medical staff like the cities yeah. are. So they don't have the resources to begin well, with to take on that kind of like, like if a wave like that happens and you know, the, in some of those rural counties, it's, it's, it's going to be harder for them. way harder. It seems like that's what we're experiencing right now. That's what we're, yours. Exactly. That's I what we're going through right now. I really believe yeah. that um, <clears throat> if you give most of the people, if you give people in this country the right information and talk about things in the right way, you can trust most of us to do the right thing. I think what's happened is our politics has gotten so polarized Yeah. that and coronavirus got politicized almost immediately in this country. That was the big mistake. Right. Because if we had kept it neutral and something we're all working together on, we could have avoided probably a lot of the issues we've had. And maybe we could have had a better lockdown at the beginning. I don't know. There seems like but, if, in, in my personal opinion, and again, I'm not, I'm not a... Um, expert on this. Um, it seems that if we had better <clears throat> protocols from the get go, like you said, if we had, been, yeah, but I'm know, talking about like our political culture, yeah, like just the way that our politicians talk to us and the way they talk to each other. So that something like this, that is a national well, issue doesn't become a left and right issue. That's where, that's where I see. That's something that we, sh- that shouldn't be the case. That's, I don't, that's, yeah. that scares me more than 
our other incompetence. Well, that's, that's well, that's a whole argument of politics and science, which again, you could that's that's the kind of idea is that there's if you look at, for example, what Governor Cooper here in North Carolina, he was having these press conferences at least once a week um, with his healthcare director. Um, who is going out there and saying, this is where we're at. These are, the, and, and, and basically giving the statistics saying, this is how many people we have. This is yeah. where we're at. This is what we need to do. Well, and he's a Democrat, right? And he's a Democrat, and some right? Of the protests, the people on the right were protesting against him. Um, a lot of the protests on the right were, were, were calling him, you know, a lot of different words for socialist, saying yeah. socialist, communist, you name it. For, for locking down... What is this, 1952? I don't, uh, yeah, again. Well, again... <laughs> and then, again this, right, well, and this is, again, I think this is some of our misconception because you're looking at, like, if you look at, like, comments online on Facebook or if you look at, like, the people that strictly protest around the governor's mansion, like, okay, that's a small group of people. I think most people are reasonable, which is why, um, to a large extent, I think he won re-election pretty easily, to be honest, is because I think he's been taking the the very middle road on this and saying, we're nice. not going to get too extreme on either way, but we want businesses That's to, good. Be, yeah. to be open. Um, but if we have a crazy situation where, you know, the, it's through the roof, which um, I think at the beginning it would have been easier to do that than it is now, because now we are all, almost a year into this and people are really tired of yeah. being told what to do. You're probably getting tired of the protests outside. Yeah, your I, well, personally, it's, <laughs> some days are entertaining. Some days it's it's a little tiring. But um, do, you, do you still see Black Lives Matter protests? Or I guess that was yesterday. There was one yesterday. Yeah, they, so yeah. The again, um, there, there's not the force of show like through the neighborhoods like there was through the summertime. Through the summertime, it would be you know given nights or weeks there would be like just you know different protests, as parades just coming through. Um, Lately, it's been more about the the, the election itself. Obviously, I, just, I wonder how Trump. long it's that kind of thing is. It like six months from now, are there still going to be protests happening on a regular basis? Like that's a new thing. That wasn't the case before this year. Right. I've lived here a long time, and you're right. It has not been. There has been protesting before for different things. There's been you know like on a specific day, a specific right. occasion, not like a general like three sixty five protest. Right. And I think you know. Um, I, th- I, I would probably contribute a lot of people using like things like Facebook groups and um, being at home through this whole quarantine thing. Right. Saying, well, social media, I don't, you know, so what had happened recently um, before and after the, actually it was about a month before the election. Um, every Saturday morning there was a, you know, you, you hear about like the Trump caravans of, of cars and boats and stuff like that. Um, they were meeting up here in downtown and making circles around the governor's mansion and honking horns for, I don't know, like an hour. Oh, before the election? Before the election, yeah. To kind of like, (laughs) to kind of like raise their uh, energy level or something. But I would, you know, because I remember I was like, what is this honking? And I go outside and it was just this caravan rounding circles. It's so interesting how the two kind of camps are so different. One group has the American flags and the pickup trucks and the right. guns, and the other camp is kind of scraggly and homemade signs. And, right. It's, and, uh, it's, it's just, just... They're not in pickup trucks. I don't know. And it's just so interesting if you watch it happen and you're like, you know, and then of course when the election happened, there's definitely some upset people that were coming down and <laughs> doing their thing. And, yeah. You know, um, don't you think it's odd how in our country things are so politicized that the kind of car you drive is also politicized? <sighs> like for some reason yeah. now driving a pickup truck means, has all these connotations. Right. Like so if you if you drive a hybrid why versus can't it a pickup truck. Why can't it just be a car? Like right. Why is it about to be a- <laughs> right. Well, and again, do you have to do you have to have a like blue lives matter thing to support police? No, I don't think so. I think you can still support law enforcement without being 100% their right all the time. And I think it's a difficult yeah, I mean it's just like you said, a lot of these you got the pandemic and then you got these extreme positions that have been kind of divided in stances that have been taken um as a result of who's in office and the election in the last four years, I think, just being more and more polarized. Um, and so that's that's has energized a lot of people, and I think it definitely energized um, people to come out and vote, which is good. Um, yeah, and it's not finished good. yet. There's a lot of work to, there's a lot of work to, yeah. to still be done. There's all kinds of things that that's that good. have not happened. It's just a matter of, okay, well, that's the first step. The first step yeah, was, absolutely. let's head in a new direction with this country. You know, it might not be what everyone wants or what yeah. everyone likes, but like you said, like, let's... Let's start talking about federal decriminalization of some of these, you know, situation uh, some of these drugs, right? Let's talk about um, mass incarcerations. Let's talk about racial injustice. Let's talk about 
um, clean air, clean water. Yeah. You know, there's cities like Flint who are still looking for clean water that they're completely overlooked. Let's talk about our environment. Let's talk about the environment and not, you know, um, you know, and also, you know, yeah, jobs and situations and reasonable incomes for people that yeah. that are out of work and have been out of work or whatever. Things change with the COVID experience. Um, yeah, totally. I think I think that has completely yeah. upended everyone's notion of what stability should be. You know? Yeah. Um, It'll be interesting uh, how it plays out, but it's crazy. Hopefully, moving in a good direction. Well, hopefully yeah. You get back to. I, I mean, thankfully, foraging you've and, been safe. I mean, and healthy. It sounds like yeah. you've been healthy throughout this. I've been. No, I've, I've been, been good. I've been thankful to be healthy. I'm glad I'm you're able for to, that. to get yeah. here. I mean, it's a blessing for. Um, thankfully, I don't personally know anyone who has succumbed fully to COVID. I know people who have okay. gotten it. I know. I know several people have um, gotten it. I don't know anyone who's died from it. My grandmother had it. Um, I've had close relatives who actually that's not true. I know two people's. I didn't know them personally, but friends of friends or family member of friends who, who did die from coronavirus. So it is, yeah. it is happening. I think that's like like the like some of the the hard part about it is that we go about our lives like okay, we're healthy, we're good, you know. Yeah, that's until until it becomes personal. And then, until it becomes a personal. And unfortunately, thing. it seems like that's you know? going to happen a lot more. And it's a real thing too. I mean, it is a real thing. Well, it's, it's not. Been, uh, you know. Yeah, it's been great talking with you. I'm glad you came back. Fun. Good this I'm glad we followed Good. up a year later. Yeah, hopefully next time it'll be a little bit more. Uh, um, I don't know, more more nature inspired and more yeah. more. Uh, you know, it sounds like we're going towards an upbeat future. Though that's the, that's I think the thing is everybody I keep talking to. I feel. I feel better and more hopeful and positive about next year, and I think it's going to be a good one. Me too. Yeah, I think so, so too. I'm looking forward to it. We'll have more gratitude after having gone through some difficulties. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for listening. If you have found this podcast valuable, there are many ways in which you can support it. You can share it with friends and on your social media. You can leave us a review on your favorite podcast listening app, and you can visit our Patreon page, patreon.com backslash a state of mind. For show notes and more information unique to each episode, visit astateofmindplay.com. And to learn more about my work as a therapist, meditation teacher, and coach, visit julianocean.us. And please don't hesitate to send me a message or email and let me know what you think and contribute to our conversation. Thank you so much for your support. It is listeners like you that make all this so very much worthwhile. Worthwhile.